Welcome, everyone. Thanks for braving the light clouds and the crowded hall. Uh, we've never had so many attendees at an event, so unfortunately we don't have seats for more than 150 people, but this is great that so many people are enthusiastic about space science and astronomy. So thank you all for coming. I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a research scientist here who also does uh, organizes these public education events. So um, just a few quick announcements before I introduce our speaker. Uh, at the door, you may have seen we have our schedule for the next six months of events. On the front side, we have seven public lectures followed by stargazing. Not all of them have a lunar eclipse, unfortunately, but we do have telescopes to view whatever awesome astronomical objects are in the sky. So I encourage you to grab one of those on your way out. On the back side is our schedule for Astronomy on Tap for the next six months. Astronomy on Tap is a series of informal talks that are given at a bar in Old Town, Pasadena. Uh, so you can have a beer and hear about space and the cosmos. And it's all free. There's also a pub quiz accompanying it. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out as well. In addition, we're having our first foreign language astronomy on tap. It's uh, astronomy on tap in Spanish in February. So uh, I encourage those of you who are Spanish speakers to attend that. Uh, so as you may have seen, there have been a lot of clouds today. Unfortunately, we get like 300 nights or nights of clear weather in Southern California, and tonight hasn't been ideal. However, uh, you can see, for those of you on this side of the room looking out, you can still see the moon. Uh, so the clouds are to some degree clearing. Hopefully they will continue to clear and we'll have decent views of the moon when it starts to eclipse in about 30 minutes. But uh, don't worry about the timing. The eclipse is not a short event like, oh, I missed it. Uh, it, takes, it takes a couple of hours to occur, it will, the partial part of the eclipse will start at about 7.30, uh, where uh, the moon starts entering the, the shadow of the Earth, and so it'll start getting darker like, a, like somebody took a big bite out of it. And it will continue, and that bite will get larger until at about 8.43, it'll enter the total stage of the eclipse where the moon starts to turn red. Hence some of the headlines calling this a, a, a blood moon, because it turns red. But don't worry, there's nothing bad about that and that will last about an hour and then uh, the partial phase will begin again and last another hour hour and a half but we're not gonna we'll only stick around till 10 because it's Sunday and people need to sleep so um, so anyway so the layout for tonight is after I stop yapping um, I will introduce our speaker for the night we'll have a roughly 30 minute talk uh, by, by Jamie, and then uh, I'll give a five-minute presentation on what to expect with the eclipse, a little bit more in-depth than what I just did, and then, uh, and then we'll have the telescope set up, and hopefully we'll have viewing. We'll also have a panel Q&A here for about two hours that you can go in and out of here if you get tired of waiting to see the eclipse. You can come in here, and we'll have a panel of experts from the astrophysics and astronomy department here to answer any question you might have about space science or physics or astronomy. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out. Anyway, okay, so our speaker tonight is Dr. Jamison Rollins. Uh, he did his undergrad at Michigan. He did his PhD with me, actually, at Columbia University and finished eight years ago and has been here since then as a staff scientist working on the LIGO project that was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2017 in physics. Uh, I mean, he wasn't awarded it. <laughs> His team, his team was awarded it, but he's an indispensable member of that team. And, uh, and so I encourage you guys to, uh, to enjoy his talk. So please welcome Dr. Jameson Rollins. Thank you. It's very cool to see so many people here. Um, all right, so as Cameron said, I work for LIGO and it's been very exciting last couple of years for us and for astronomy because of us, I think. So uh, let me give you guys an introduction to LIGO and what we've been doing and how we're kind of revolutionizing astronomy right now. Um, um, hold on. Eh. All right. 
Okay, this is a gravitational wave. So gravitational waves were predicted by Einstein in his general theory of relativity, which he published in uh, 1916. And so one of the very interesting things is his theory of gravity, the general theory of relativity, and he predicts that there are these waves of gravity. So this is an example of just like a tube with a gravitational wave traveling down the, the axis of the tube. So it's to give you a, a, a sense of what the, um, the wave looks like as it travels. So back after he made this prediction, um, people didn't really initially believe that it would be possible to see these waves because they're really, really small. And I'll talk about that later. But um, back in uh, 1993, these two guys got the Nobel Prize for showing that a binary system, which is, the, in this case, it was two neutron stars where one of them was a, um, um, a pulsar, which emits these pulses of radio waves, were their orbit was speeding up. And what they showed was that the rate at which the orbit was speeding up was exactly matching the prediction you would get from Einstein's general theory of relativity for if this system was emitting gravitational waves. So that was, it was not a direct detection of gravitational waves, but it was our first real evidence that these waves were a real phenomenon that existed. And so what, what you're seeing in the background here is the curvature of space-time that is the cause of, that the curvature is being caused by these two neutron stars orbiting around each other, and the ripples you see are the gravitational waves. Oops. All right, so here's, here's one, a cross-section of that ring, right? So what you can see here is as the wave passes through, it causes the ring to squash in one dimension and expand in the other. And, and then, you know, as the wave oscillates through, it, 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 it uh, changes the axis in which the, the squashing and expanding are happening. And we call this a strain. So what the gravitational wave is producing is a strain in space-time. And this device... So there, we, we, for people tried to start looking for gravitational waves by seeing if they could um, pick up the vibrations with like large masses that would ring like a bell, and um, those were called um, bar detectors. But they didn't have any success with those. And then in the 70s, a couple of people had this idea to use light to see if we could measure the um, strain caused by these gravitational waves passing through the Earth. And so this is a device called a Michelson interferometer, where you have a laser beam that shoots and hits a beam splitter mirror, splits into two arms, goes down and hits mirrors at the ends of the arms, and then the laser beams come back together and recombine at this beam splitter. But what you can see is happens is if the arm lengths change relative to each other, then you get either light coming out this, this port here, which we call the dark port, because it's nominally, there's no light going there. But if the mirrors move a little bit, then you get some light coming out. And that's kind of the principle of how these Michelson interferometers work. All right. So what they had was this brilliant idea, which was, well, maybe we can just use these Michelson interferometers to hear these gravitational waves. Basically, the way that the gravitational wave, the way that the interferometer you know, responds to the stretching of the arms is basically the exact same thing that happens when a gravitational wave passes by, right? So this is the, this is the cross-section of the tube, string, uh, squashing and expanding, and you can see if you attach the end mirrors of the Michelson interferometer onto the ring, then the mirrors move and you get light alternatively coming out and not coming out of that dark port. And so potentially these interferometers are detectors of these waves. So then, after many years of research and development and trying to make these interferometers more and more and more sensitive, these, the people that originally made these experiments went to the National Science Foundation and said, hey, we'd like a bunch of money to make a really big version of this. 
because we know that if there are gravitational waves coming and they're hitting the Earth, they're really, really weak, and it's going to be really hard to hear them, and we need a really big Michelson interferometer to be able to detect them. So they made a compelling enough case that the National Science Foundation gave them money in, to make, in fact, two of these detectors, because we argued that we wouldn't be able to determine definitively that we had heard a signal from outer space if we only had one detector. Because if we had one detector, it, we might have just been hearing a glitch or some you know, earthquake rumble or something like that. But if we have two detectors that are far away from each other and don't talk to each other, then if we hear a signal in both detectors at the same time, then that's a really good indication that the signal came from outer space. So these, this, is, this is LIGO. This one's in Washington State, in eastern Washington, and this one's in uh, Livingston, Louisiana, which is uh, northwest of New Orleans. And you can see it's a desert here, and it's basically a swamp here. Um, and these arms are four kilometers long. So this is two and a half mile long arms. And this is, it's basically, it's the, it's the Michelson interferometer, like I just described, except it's more complicated, because it's got... It's basically doing, we're doing all these tricks with the light to try to, you know, we put in a lot of laser light and we try to bounce it around to sort of amplify the signal. But basically the laser and the, the beam splitter are in this building and then there's a mirror here and a mirror down at the other end of the other arm and the, we shoot the light through, it bounces down these arms, come, comes back together and we detect that little bit of light that leaks out of the, the port on the other side. So this is what it looks like in, the, in that big central building. And so you can see, here's a person for scale. So these are big chambers that hold the mirrors. So instead of having little mirrors, we've got big mirrors that are, well, here, I'll show you a picture right here. This is all, by the way, this is all a vacuum system. So we're trying to keep, the, we're, we're trying to make this interferometer as sensitive to motion as we possibly can. So we've got to shield it from everything else in the universe. And so basically we put it in this big vacuum system so there's not even any air molecules that are banging around in there at all. So this is what the mirrors look like. And so this here is the mirror. It's actually got a cover on it to protect it right now. But this is the mirror. It's hanging in from this big suspension system. This is actually hanging by these little tiny fibers from this mirror here, which is hanging by fibers from more stuff up here. It's all hanging from the ceiling, which is not actually the ceiling. It's a big table, which is a big seismic isolation table. That's all, the whole point of this whole structure here is to isolate this mirror from any of the motion of the ground. So if the ground moves, this mirror does not move. That's the goal. Here's another picture I really like, which is at the end station. So here is, the, here is the end mirror, and down this tube here is two and a half miles down that way is the, is the beam splitter, the vertex. And then this is a contraption that takes the little bit of light that leaks through this mirror. Remember, most of the light comes down here and then bounces back, but a tiny little bit leaks through, and then that gets shot up to this uh, optical table up here where we can read out some diagnostic information. All right, so the important thing to emphasize about LIGO is that it is really a transducer. This is sort of a technical description. It's a transducer, transducer of differential space-time strain into electrical signals. And so that differential space-time strain, that's the effect that the gravitational wave has as it passes through space. So really what LIGO is, it's a microphone for space-time. So I, to me, I really love this analogy, because basically what we're doing with LIGO is that for the entire history of astronomy, all we've been able to do is look at the sky with telescopes. I won't say all, because we've been able to do a lot of stuff by looking at the sky with telescopes, or listening to it with radio uh, antenna, or X-ray telescopes. But all of those telescopes are looking at the electromagnetic signals that come from distant objects. But gravitational waves are a completely different physical phenomenon. They're not, it's, it's not electromagnetism. It comes from much different kinds of you know, motion of matter on a bulk scale. 
And so it causes, when this, you know, when you have a lot of matter moving around, it causes these ripples in space-time, these waves, and we hear these waves with LIGO. So I really like to talk about, instead of seeing with LIGO, hearing with LIGO, because it really complements the way that we see with telescopes with, you know, having this, these microphones for listening to outer space. So it's a completely new thing. It's like we have been completely unable to hear what's going on in the universe until now. So it's really a very big paradigm shift in what we can do with astronomy. All right, so this is kind of, this is kind of the one technical graph I'm going to show because it's really, in some sense, it's our most fundamental graph, and I think it's really kind of informative to see. So this is if you take the... Uh, what you call a spectrum of the signal that comes out of LIGO. So imagine you've got a microphone that's sitting in an empty room, and you turn up, you, there's no sound in the room at all, and you turn up the microphone, the volume up, really, really loud. Probably everybody can imagine what you're going to hear is like a hiss, right? Just like a background hiss. Well, what do you hear? What is that hiss exactly? That hiss is probably coming from the electronics in the microphone, right? The microphone may be just, you know, residually moving around because of the air molecules in the room that are not being caused by other sounds, but just because the, the air molecules are just moving because of thermal motion, because they're not at absolute zero. Or the electronics in the microphone itself or in the amplifier may cause some noise. So this, this is the spectrum of that same thing, that same hiss for LIGO. So this is our, our ultimate sensitivity. That hiss determines how, um, how s faint of a signal you can hear, right? If you've got a microphone that's got a loud hiss on it, then you're not going to be able to hear any signals that are smaller than that hiss, right? That, are, that, are, that aren't louder than that hiss. The hiss is going to mask that signal. And so this is, that, this is that, that same hiss for LIGO. And so we, we measure this all the time because this tells us how good we're doing. So you can see at the, the, um, the, the y-axis is amplitude, basically, and the x-axis is frequency. So for a microphone, you know, what's the frequency that we can hear, that we hear with our ears, right? It's about 100 hertz to... 100 to a kilohertz or 10 kilohertz. So interestingly, this is 10 hertz here, this is 100 hertz, and this is 1,000 hertz. So very interestingly, the audio, the frequency band that we hear with LIGO is exactly the same frequency band that we can hear with our ears. Totally coincidentally. It's not, it's, that, that's not done on purpose. That's just that the, the things that limit our sensitivity happen to be the things that limit it to this audio band. And so what you see here is this black dashed line is what our theoretical goal was for, for how low we were going to make the hiss, the background hiss in LIGO. And it's limited by basically by this, this green curve here, this blue curve, and this red curve, the, the, the dashed lines. And those are all fundamental physical limitations in the detector itself. The green is the residual seismic noise, so we try to get rid of any motion of the ground by having those suspension systems and seismic isolation platforms. But we still have a, a little bit of that residual motion gets down to the bottom of the test mass, and that makes this green curve here. The, t the mirrors are not at absolute zero. They're not at absolute zero temperature. They have some residual temperature. In fact, they're at ro regular room temperature. And what makes temperature is molecules moving, right? That's what, what makes something warm to the touch is the fact that the molecules are moving around a lot more than something that's cool to the touch. So because the molecules in the mirror are moving around, that, is, that limits how small of a motion we can see with that mirror. So you guys can maybe start to get a sense of how small of a motion we're actually looking for with these detectors because we're now worried about 
the residual motion of the molecules in the mirrors because they're not at absolute zero temperature. So that's, we're getting really small. Okay, now this blue curve is interesting because that's what we call quantum noise. So because we're, we're ma we've made these detectors so sensitive, we're, we're sensitive to quantum mechanical effects in the detector. So the primary one is that the laser beam is a quantum mechanical thing. It's made, the light is made up of individual photons, individual quanta of light, right? And those, those little photons, those little bits of packets of light, don't all hit the mirror at the same time. They hit the mirror like rain, right? And each time one of those packets of light hits the mirror, it pushes the mirror just a little bit. And so the rain all bouncing on the mirror causes the mirror to fluctuate. And that's a quantum mechanical noise. That adds a hiss that we can hear in this, in this region over here. And so you put all these together and you get this theoretical limit as to how low we can make, how sensitive we can make these detectors, how small we can make the hiss, the background hiss in the detector. And these, these, these um, more noisy curves you see up here, that's how well we're actually doing. So this is how well we are, how well we're doing as of this past October. We've gotten a little bit better than this, but basically this is where we're at now. And these, these gray curves in the background, this is the, this gray curve here is where we were doing back in um, 01, back in September 2015. And this light gray one in the background is when we, what we were doing in, um, back in 2009. When we, made, when we finished our first um, construction of the detector and before we took it all apart to make it better. And so you can see we've improved a lot and we're still not at this, what we call this design sensitivity yet, but we're trying to get there. We're working hard on improving that right now, in fact. So there's something I want to point out. So here's the strain, right? That's that thing I was talking about that we measure of the space time. Over here is the displacement. So what this is, it's the same, it's, it's a little bit different measure, but this is, this is saying how much actual motion do we see in meters in the interferometer. Remember I was saying that the Michelson interferometer is two arms, and we're measuring a differential motion of the arms. Well, how big of a motion do we actually detect with these detectors? At this point, it's hard to even, uh, you know, understand what these numbers are. But right here, basically, we're less than 10 to the minus 20 meters. 10 to the minus 20 meters. This still boggles my mind to think about it. How, how, how big is a micron? How big is a millimeter? That's 10 to the minus 3 meters. How big is a micron, which is like less than this, the size of your hair? That's 10 to the minus 6 meters. A nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meters. The size of an atom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. That's 10 orders of magnitude bigger than this. So, you, so the size from a meter, I'm, a, I'm like roughly 2 meters tall, to an atom, that's 10 to the, that's, you know, 10 orders of magnitude. You have to go another 10 orders of magnitude to get to the distances that we can measure with these detectors. I've been doing this for basically 20 years and it still blows my mind every time I say this. This is a, a cartoon of this. This is an atom. It's like a hydrogen atom. That's the electron zooming around. We're zooming in to the proton at the middle of the atom. That is the motion that we can see. This is like the edge of the proton. It's crazy. I, I, I acknowledge that. But it works. We do it. All right. So LIGO, advanced LIGO, like I said, there was an initial LIGO that started construction back in like uh, 2000. We built it up. We, we took data for a while. We didn't see anything. We got some money to do this big upgrade. And we were going to start our first observing run on September 18, 2015. And then on September 14th, 
while we were in what we call an engineering run, where we, where we were like preparing to start our official run, and we were still messing around, but then we would leave it quiet at night and let it take data, we saw our first event. So it was like before we had even really fully turned it on, we saw this signal. And it was really loud. And we, so we knew loud for us, right? I mean, that's like moving like a proton size. But this is, this is, um, this is what we saw. So this is, this is the, the raw data. It's been filtered a little bit, so it's not exactly the raw data. But you can start to see these, these interesting squiggles in it. And this is the, the, the Washington detector. This is the Louisiana detector. This here is a numerical simulation of two black holes colliding together. A numerical simulation of the, of the gravitational wave that would pass through Earth of two black holes colliding together. If you take this signal, subtract this signal, then you're just left with noise. You're left with nothing. So the point is, is that what we detected is basically matches to the precision that we can measure it exactly the, the signals that we predict by general relativity from two black holes colliding. So this, was, this is not how we do the detection, for what it's worth, but this is just an example of, to, to sort of demonstrate that, what we're seeing. And this is, this is a, um, a spectrogram of that signal. So you can see that this is time going on, along, and this is 0.3 seconds, and this is 0.45 seconds. So this is only 150 milliseconds long here. And these are the different frequencies, like there were on the x-axis of that other graph. So here's 30 hertz, 128 hertz, 512 hertz. And you can see that this, these, this chirp signal, where you get the frequency, um, gets uh, the pitch goes up with time, and the amplitude goes up. So it's a I can't, didn't whistle very well. That's the signal. It's very short, though. In, so in actuality, if you, if you listen to it in, in, uh, in full speed, it just sounds like a little click. But if you slow it down, um, you get to hear the full chirp. And so this is another simulation of the, of the same two black holes that we think we observed. In this, in this case, what it is is this is imagining if you're, you're pretty close to the black holes and watching them sort of against the, the night sky in the background. And you can see all of, this, all of this crazy stuff happening that you're seeing is the space-time being warped by the black holes orbiting around each other. And it's causing the light from the stars behind it to bend. All right. So we, we took data for a whole year, and we ended up hearing three black holes. And I say three with a star because we definitely heard these, these, I'm sorry, we heard three black hole mergers, which is actually, it uh, depends how you want to count it. It's, you know, each, you have two black holes that merge into a new one. And so the, the, um, these three mergers, and then we had one merger that was, it was a little bit quiet, so we weren't totally sure that it was from outer space. And it could have been you know, a, just a glitch in our detector, but we were, were pretty confident, but we still put an asterisk by it. Um, so then, fast forward to 2017. We've, we've improved the detectors more. We've spent a lot of time trying to make them even more sensitive, try to work out all the kinks, try to make that hiss be even quieter. And we start another, we do another observing run. Later in that observing run, our European counterpart called Virgo comes online. And Virgo is near Pisa in Italy, and it's very similar design to the LIGO detectors. And then, right after they come online, we hear another gravitational wave. And interestingly, we get a little bit of a blip in the Virgo detector. So it's kind of proof that we can hear, that the Virgo detector can hear gravitational waves as well, which is great, because What we ultimately want to do, I mean, there's a couple things that we want to do. What, we obviously want to hear as many of these signals as we can. But what we can do with LIGO, or specifically with a network of LIGO, with many LIGOs ar around the globe, is 
to try to identify where in space the signal came from. So gra the, these, LIGO, these gravitational wave detectors are pretty much omnidirectional. They can hear gravitational waves coming from anywhere in space. If you've got two of them, then you can start to triangulate where in space it came from because the wave will hit one detector before it hits the other. If you've got three, then you can make an even better estimation of where it came from in the sky. So if you can make, if you can say with certainty that uh, the gravitational wave came from a very particular point in the sky, then you can tell telescopes to go look over there to see if they see anything. And wouldn't that be cool if we saw something that happened, like an explosion, around the same time that we heard gravitational waves. And so this is an indication of what we call the sky localization. So if you just have the two LIGO detectors, what you get is these big bands, swaths across the sky of where we think the gravitational wave came from. And this is, these, these, these bands, they kind of look small in this, in this you know, all sky picture, but this is actually a lot of area. I mean, there's you know, billions of galaxies and stuff in this in these areas. So we can't, we can't tell people to just go look all over the place for an explosion. I mean, it's too big of an area. But you can see here, once we got the Virgo detector in, the area, the sky localization, starts to get much smaller, which is very encouraging. All right. Then, in August 17th of 2017, we heard a very interesting signal, one that we have been waiting for for a long time. So everything that we've heard up till now are these binary black holes, right? They're, each, the black holes are about 10 to 20, 30 times the mass of the sun. They're very, very massive, but they're black holes. And what do we know about black holes? Is that no light comes out of a black hole. You smash two black holes together, still no light comes out. You just get a bigger black hole. All right, but what we were hoping to see were the collision of two neutron stars. So neutron stars are made of matter that is not quite as exotic as black hole matter. We don't actually know what's inside of a black hole. We just know that nothing is coming out of it. That's why it makes it really hard to know what's going on inside. But neutron stars are made up of neutrons. And we know a lot about neutrons. And we know that if you, we speculate that if you smash two giant balls of neutrons together, it's going to make a really big explosion in electromagnetic light that we should be able to see with telescopes. So in, in, in um, 2000, August 2017, we heard a very interesting signal that was much longer than the other signals, right? This, remember, the other signal was just a fraction of a second long. And this is, this is six seconds here, right? This is just the last six, six seconds of the signal. It's much longer. And then, right after this, we saw the, the end of our signal, within less than two seconds later, a gamma ray observatory saw a gamma ray flash. So that's very interesting. Those two signals were very close together. So that made us really, really, really excited that maybe something interesting was going on. So here's an example of how long that signal was, right? This, these are the other signals we detected, right? They're really short. And then this is this new one that came in. Almost a minute long was it in, what did we hear it? We heard it for a minute, basically. So these signals, right, this is one second. So these other binary black hole signals are much shorter. And that's an that's a, that's a indicator that this new signal we saw was very different than the other ones. And in fact, the masses that we predicted from this, this um, new signal was the masses we predict that neutron stars are, which is about one and a half times the mass of the sun. And so this is, again, that, that sky localization map like I showed before, but here's the new signal, right? And you can see that's a really small, a, a relatively small area, and it's small enough that we could tell people with telescopes, hey, maybe you could just go scan around in that area and see if you see something interesting. And of course, astronomers are much more clever and they've got much more sophisticated ways to go and see if there is a new star in a particular region of space. And so after we made this detection, we told astronomers, like, hey, there's something interesting going on over there. You might want to look. 
And all, these are all telescopes across the earth that then went and took pictures of that point in the sky. And then a bunch of space-based ones too, like Hubble took pictures. And probably it's safe to say that in the weeks after this, pretty much every telescope on the planet probably pointed at this point in the sky because what we saw was a totally new thing. So here, here again is the localization. And I, I'm, I, I'm focusing on this because this is the thing that is really the game changer in astronomy right now, right? So this is Fermi. Fermi was the thing that it's a space, it's a space satellite that heard that uh, or saw that gamma ray burst, right? But they didn't really know where it was coming from, right? They have this really big area on the sky. Then, you know, they, they localized it with another detector. Then you had the two LIGO and Virgo detectors that make a much smaller point in the sky. These are all the galaxies that are in that region. Zoom in on this one. And then watch out for it. So this is, this, this is a galaxy here. Oh, it's in the next. So here's another, here's another zoom in. This is the, that's the Milky Way. This is the, this is the region that we localized it to. And you can see there's a lot of stuff going on here, right? There's a lot of stuff in the sky. So it's, it's, it's an interesting challenge still, even with this reduced area that we've given them, to find something that's got, um, that has something interesting going on. And so here, zooming into the, zooming into the galaxy. And then notice right here. That's what we saw. <laughs> and it seems incredible that we would be able to find that needle in the haystack. But we, we, we have a kind of a lot of tricks up our sleeves nowadays. Because, for instance, we, the LIGO had a prediction because of how we can, you know, we, we have, we, we suspect that this is from neutron stars. We can make these numerical simulations about what the waveforms look like, how far away they are. And we can basically give you an estimate of how far away it is. So in fact, this galaxy is right at the distance at which we suspected that the signal came from. And so here is a bunch of other astronomical um, pictures that were taken with other telescopes. And you can see, here's the, here's the galaxy, and here's this new little dot in the galaxy here. And it doesn't really look like much in these pictures, but I can guarantee you that astronomers lost their minds over this. <laughs> they were really incredibly excited because this is the first time we have ever been able to observe a signal like this. Here's another example. So what was interesting about this signal is that um, it is what's... Here's, here's another... Here's the... Here's the signal here as it's fading away. So this is, the, this is the, the wavelength, the color, and this is how bright it is. And you can see it sort of like gets redder as time goes on. You know, as the wavelength, the peak of the wavelength starts to move up. That means basically it's cooling down over time. So this is all evidence that what we, we actually saw here was the explosion that was associated with that gravitational wave that we saw. All right, so... This is a plot of gamma ray bursts that we've seen, okay? So we've seen a lot of gamma ray bursts, but we weren't exactly sure where they came from. We've seen two kinds of gamma ray bursts. We've seen these long GRBs and these short GRBs. And we've always speculated that these short GRBs come from the collision of two neutron stars to make these big explosions. But we've never actually... Um, been able to observe the optical afterglow of these gamma ray bursts because we've never been able to localize in the sky well enough to be able to point telescopes at them. We just basically have these gamma ray detectors which are just listening to the whole sky and then they, 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 get, they feel a burst go by but they're not exactly sure where it comes from. But LIGO, because it heard that neutron star for a minute before it collided, 
was able to give us a very good indication on the sky of where it was. And so what we were able to see was this gamma ray burst that was a lot weaker than anything that we had seen before. And had we were able to then take pictures of it with telescopes. So this was basically a completely new thing that astronomers had never done before. And of course, I mean, just detecting of the gravitational waves from this was completely new. But the fact that we could tell astronomers where to look was also really new. And what, like, what we learned is that, or one of the things that we think we're learning from this event is that a lot of the heavy metals, the, the stuff that's lower down in the periodic table, is probably actually created in these neutron star mergers. It's not created in stars. It's this, this, when stars explode, they're not energetic enough to make these really heavy elements. But these neutron star mergers probably are. Okay, yeah. Okay, so just to, to summarize, this is now all of the events that we have seen with LIGO. So these are all the black hole mergers. We've now heard 10 black hole mergers, and we've still only heard that one binary neutron star merger, which is down here. So these are the two neutron stars, and this is whatever the remnant was, which we're not sure of. Was it a black hole? Was it a neutron star? Interestingly, you can see that there's kind of a gap here. These are other black holes that we've detected with X-rays. So we've never seen any neutron stars or black holes in this region. So we're really curious about what's going on in that region. All right. So the last thing I want to say is that what we're trying to do is increase this network of gravitational wave detectors. We've got the two in the U.S., the LIGO, two LIGO detectors. We've uh, partnered with India to build another identical detector in India. This is the um, Virgo detector which is this, I'm sorry, this is old. This is not under construction. They actually obviously detected an event with us. There's a, a, a much weaker uh, detector in Germany, uh, but is still an interesting sort of research and development thing. And then the Japanese are building a detector. So the goal of this is that if we get this network, that we can really pinpoint in the sky where these events are coming from. And we've already seen one binary neutron star collision. And we expect that af af as, as we keep increasing the sensitivity of the detectors, that we should be able to see a lot more. So probably, hopefully, in our next year of observation, which will start in April, we may be able to see, you know, like five of these. And again, these are totally new things. They're telling us totally new stuff. So this, this is now what we call multi-messenger astronomy, because we've got two messengers, which in this case are gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves, that are coming from the same thing in the sky. And by putting the two together, we learn a lot more than even the two individually about what's going on in those explosions. And so just the last slide, we're trying to figure out how we can make these detectors even more sensitive to, to hear these events even further away. And so we've got a lot of um, things that we're working on. We're trying to improve the detectors we have right now. We're talking about building what we call our next generation of detectors that would have more light power. The, we would do these crazy things called light squeezing to make the quantum noise be lower. We're going to try to make them cryogenic, cool them down to like uh, you know, 100 degrees um, below zero. Um, have better seismic isolation. The, the real thing we want, though, is to make the arms longer. Remember, our arms right now are four kilometers long. We'd like to make them 10 or 40 kilometers long because then we could hear even further. And there's already projects. There's a project called LISA that's trying to put one of these in space and have uh, two sat or three satellites that are shooting laser beams all you know, for between each other. And the length of those arms is a million kilometers. And those can hear a whole different kinds of gravitational waves, like from black holes falling into supermassive black holes in the center of the galaxy, a whole bunch of interesting stuff. So in our lifetime, if we can make these next generation of detectors, we should hope hear binary star mergers potentially years before they collide. So LISA, the space-based one, should be able to tell us in a year, in a year from now, Go look over there, and you'll see an explosion. And give us lots of time to prepare. And if we make these really long arm ones in, um, on the ground, we can potentially hear basically every black hole merger in the universe. Because we'll be able the, the, the distance at which we'll be able to hear these black holes will basically be 
the horizon of the universe. So it's basically to the edge of the universe. And then still a whole bunch of, we're hoping to hear stuff that we didn't even expect. That'll be even more exciting. So there's a pretty uh, bright future ahead. Thank you. Five minutes. Okay. So I, I went a little bit long, but I'll, I'll hang around for the panel. Um, but I'll still take a couple questions right now. If I, I think we can take like two or three questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I could, but it would take a really long time. Um, yeah, maybe for the Q&A panel. I mean, it, that's basically, you're, a, you're basically asking about all of the tricks we do in the detector to amplify the signal. And it's not at all a trade secret, but it would take a long time to, to explain it. But basically, yeah, we're looking for tiny phase shifts in the light. And we, and we, we, we have a lot of tricks that we can make, the, make it more sensitive. Yeah? Right. Yeah, that's a very good question. So she, the question was, um, do the gravitational waves always precede the light? And um, we're not, ex not exactly sure, possibly. The, um, the gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. So they should travel at the same speed that the light travels. However, the light... They're, they're produced by different things, right? The gravitational waves come from the bulk motion of the two black holes or the two neutron stars moving around each other. And so, for instance, when we say that we're going to hear neutron star mergers a year ahead of time, that's we're hearing it long before the neutron stars merge together and make an explosion in light. But we still think that even, even with the events that we're detecting, you know, we, we still, the, the neutron star merger that we observed, we still heard it for almost a minute before the actual explosion would have happened. Of course, there's some light is starting to come out in that time, but it's not as if the gravitational waves and the light are basically emitted at the exact same time and, you know, one of them gets to us before the other. They, they should travel at the same time, but the light comes from more complicated dynamics and chemistry of the matter that's, you know, burning up in the explosion. All right. I understand a lot of you are very anxious to go outside and see the eclipse. So uh, we'll take more questions after, uh, during the Q&A panel. But please thank our speaker, Dr. Jameson Rollins. All right. For those of you who stuck around, um, the first thing that I'm going to do is I didn't have time to put together a presentation. So I'm going to show this super awesome NASA astrophysics thing that was done as part of the Lunar Reconnaissance Mission um, uh, that is a very quick and dirty explanation of what's going on during an eclipse and then show you a video that was taken from a number of images of a previous lunar eclipse to show you kind of what to expect and what's actually going on. So this is only two minutes long. So. Like clockwork, the full moon appears every month in our sky, a sight so familiar that we often take it for granted. But about twice a year, over the course of a few hours, the full moon sports a decidedly different look. What causes this sudden change? A lunar eclipse occurs when the moon passes through the Earth's shadow, just as a solar eclipse occurs when part of the Earth passes through the moon's shadow. But the moon circles the Earth every month as it cycles through its phases, lining up at both full moon and new moon. So why don't eclipses happen twice a month? The reason is that the moon's orbit around the Earth is tilted relative to the Earth's orbit around the sun. Although the Earth and the moon always cast long shadows, they rarely shade each other thanks to the moon's orbital tilt. But if that's the case, why do eclipses happen at all? 
Throughout the year, the moon's orbital tilt remains fixed with respect to the stars, meaning that it changes with respect to the sun. About twice a year, this puts the moon in just the right position to pass through the Earth's shadow, causing a lunar eclipse. As the moon passes into the central part of the Earth's shadow, called the umbra, it darkens dramatically. Once it's entirely within the umbra, the moon appears a dim red due to sunlight scattered through the Earth's atmosphere. In fact, if you watched the eclipse from the surface of the moon, you'd see the sun set behind the entire Earth, bathing you in a warm red glow. Back home, you'll have to stay up late to watch a lunar eclipse, but if you do, you'll see the moon in rare form, and you'll catch a brief glimpse of our own planet's long shadow. All right, so I think that's a pretty good explanation, but I really like this in terms of visualizing what to actually expect over the course of the night. So as the eclipse begins, as the, the moon starts to pass into the Earth's shadow, its front edge will start to get darker and darker. This is the stage of the eclipse that we're in right now. Um, and as it continues to go into this total shadow called the umbra, um, it just looks like there's a big bite taken out of the moon until it finally covers it and you start to see this red phase which is when the only light that's actually reaching the the moon is passing through the atmosphere of the earth and being refracted and having all of the blue light scattered out much like you see when you look at the sunset and eventually we get through that phase that phase will last from about 841 to 943 or so um, and then it starts the partial phase again when it starts uh, escaping from the the umbra, the the dark shadow, and there's a additional visualization here with actually showing the umbra, but you get the idea. So that's what's happening tonight. Lunar eclipses tend to happen uh, somewhere on the Earth every six months or so. Uh, this is the last one that'll happen that's visible from North America for the next two years or so, but it's no big deal. And lunar eclipses, <laughs> it's no big deal. Uh, lunar eclipses happen, as I said, pretty frequently, um, and they're visible from a very, very large swath of the Earth, whereas solar eclipses, like the one that happened a year and a half ago, uh, the, the, well, raise your hand if you, if you saw the total eclipse, if you went to totality, the region of totality. It was pretty awesome. You saw it on YouTube? Okay, that's fair enough. So that's a very, very small region of the Earth where you have the, the, the moon shadow casting that, that uh, region as opposed to right now, everywhere that can see the moon right now, it appears red or will appear red. You can see the lunar eclipse. But with the solar eclipse, it's only a small region where you actually get that total shadow. Uh, and the next total solar eclipse is occurring this year. In, uh, but it won't be visible from here. It'll be visible from Chile and Argentina and the southern part of South America. So I encourage you to fly there if you have the means because it's awesome. Um, okay, are there any questions about the moon or the eclipse or moon phases or anything like that? Sure. Um, so when the... Right, you understand. So the sun is here, the earth is here, and the moon is here. And when they're all lined up, then any light that would normally go directly to illuminate the moon is being... Oh, goodness. <laughs> is, being, is being totally blocked by the Earth. The Earth is in the way of light that would normally go and hit the moon and light it up. The only light that is actually able to reach the moon is passing around the, the edge of the Earth. Because, you know, we have the... We have the disk of the Earth, which is mostly Earth, you know, rock and dirt and all of that. Um, and along the edge, there's the small layer of the atmosphere. And that atmosphere is able, the light can hit it, and it can refract and bend. And so what, what would normally not even reach the, the moon is able to refract and bend around it. And in doing so, that light, the blue light gets scattered out, which is why when we look up in the, in the day sky, it appears blue. Um, and only the red light is able to make it through and hit the, the moon and light it up only with the red light, which then reflects back to us on the night side looking up at the moon. Does that roughly make sense? You'd see a ring around the Earth from the light that's refracting through the atmosphere all around the edge of the Earth at that moment and scattering out the blue light uh, 
Yeah, scattering out the blue light because short wavelengths of light um, are much more effectively scatter against uh, uh, the, the molecules in our atmosphere. But the red light is able to kind of make it through that. Yeah, and, and the only light that's able to make it there would be red light, so the whole surface of the moon just appears red. Yeah, of course. If we had no atmosphere, then it would be totally dark. It's the fact that we have an atmosphere that's able to refract the, uh, the light around it and scatter out that blue, that blue light. But yeah, if we didn't have an atmosphere, no light would make it, and it would just be a dark, dark spot. Any other questions? Yes. That is because, so the question is, if, if uh, oh, I'm watching some other video here. I don't even know what this is. <laughs> uh, um, the question is, why is there a period that this, the moon appears white and isn't red the entire time? And that is because, ah, it's because, um, that's a good question. Uh, the reason it goes dark without being red, there is preferentially red, uh, but it's that the illuminated side is so, so much brighter than the, the shaded region that it just outshines that. that. Um, yeah, the moon gets considerably darker when it's, this doesn't really represent that that well. Uh, it's on the order of 500 times darker. Although to our eye, our eye doesn't estimate it as 500 times because our eye operates on a logarithmic scale. But, um, but yeah, if you can, even if for those of you on the edge here, you can look out and see the moon and it's about half eaten up right now. Um, yeah, so we'll set up the Q&A panel here in the next five minutes, and you guys are encouraged to stick around and ask whatever astrophysical questions you have, either about gravitational waves or the moon or aliens. I don't know, whatever you want. Uh, but we'll be here until till uh, we'll be here until nine o'clock, maybe later, um, and then the the telescopes will be set up till ten. So thank you all for coming. Yeah. Oh, totality begins at eight forty-one and lasts until 9.43. So you've still got 35 minutes until totality begins. As I said, we're only about halfway through the partial phase where, where the moon appears half, half bitten out of right now. All right. So we'll get started with the panel Q&A. Um, our, our expert panel tonight consists of graduate students and a postdoc uh, from the astronomy and from the physics departments. Uh, we've got Ron So, uh, who is happy to answer questions about black holes, gravitational waves, and general relativity. We've got Kishale Day, uh, who is happy to answer questions about telescopes and how, how stars die. Excellent. A little morbid. Mia de los Reyes will answer questions about galaxies, how stars are born. A little more positive. Uh, Lee Rosenthal will answer questions about planets and novae, which are uh, short period bursts on the surface of stars. Um, and I'm Cameron, and I'm happy to talk about a bunch of stuff, but the stuff I wrote here is the moon, because, well, everyone's excited about the moon, and, uh, and simulations and galaxies and such. So do we have any questions from the audience? So the question was, why was the Nobel Prize in Physics awarded just to three individuals? Uh, Kip Thorne, Barry, Barry, what? Brainer Weiss and Bar Barry Barish? Yeah, uh, and Barry and Kip are both here. Uh, so why was it awarded, awarded to them and not the entire experimental team? Um, perhaps others can add to this, but I just know that with the Nobel Prize, they have a stipulation for the award that it can only go to a maximum number of three people. And that's, I mean, because the Nobel Prize started in the early 20th or 
late 19th century when science was primarily done by individuals as opposed to large teams. And today, so much science is done by, you know, teams of hundreds or in some cases thousands of members and it's just not kept in line with the, the Nobel Prize Award Committee. But Just for context, I mean, I can't remember, it was either 2012 or 2013 when the Nobel Prize was given for um, their discovery of the Higgs boson. It's kind of a similar case where there's a huge team of people and it went to three, the, the three theorists. I, I, so uh, I, maybe it's just how they decide like giving to just people who come up with the idea upon which the discovery was based. And plus, it's only like a million dollars, and if you split that a thousand ways, then is it? Oh, it's ten million. Okay, well, it's on the order of a million or a few million dollars, and if you split it a thousand or ten thousand ways, here's a hundred bucks to you and a hundred bucks to you. So, there's a very long history of the Nobel Prize being awarded somewhat unfairly. So professors have been known to take credit for the work that their grad students actually did. And this more often happens when the grad students or junior scientists are women. Just putting that out there. Okay. Jocelyn Bell. Jocelyn Bell is a very good example for the discovery of pulsars. Uh, any other questions? We have lots of time to answer questions. So. The which prize? The Brechtel Prize. Oh, Breakthrough Prize is a bit more fair. Sure, that's fair. I don't know. Like my, um, okay. Um, this is how I understand the question is being asked: is that um, sort of when something moves very fast, time gets dilated. Um, so he's talking about you know you have a rapid expansion in the universe during the Big Bang, uh, this inflation um, uh, part of the universe, and then we are expanding more and more right now. I guess you can think of it. So. Yeah, yeah, that's, well, that's the things about measuring, like, velocities like this, you know, it's like, it's, it's a little bit tricky to do it on, like, on this, like, on this, on this type of scale, um, just because, like, everything's relative to one another, but one other thing about the expansion is, like, rather than thinking of it as just, like, rather than just, like, it accelerating away, it's really just an increase of, of entropy, this order is just increasing, so that's kind of, like, a better terminology to assign to it. And also during the inflation, um, there's like a description of how like it inflated like faster than the speed of light or something. There's, there's an explanation I completely forgot. I don't know. Right. Okay, so if you think about, so when, when he says that everything is relative and measuring time and space are both relative, if a car drives by you, you think that you're not moving and the car is moving. The car thinks that you're the one that's moving. Like whoever's sitting in the car, they're just sitting in the car. They're not moving. You're the one that's moving by them. Does that make sense? So in general, things are located, like things like the Earth, uh, the entire Milky Way, our galaxy, are located at a specific place, like a specific coordinate in, in space. And when we say that the space itself is expanding, if you think of like a grid of points, the points are just moving farther apart. But the, so space itself is the thing that's moving, not us. So it, Of 
So yeah, the point is, it's okay, when we say the Big Bang, it's partly because we don't know what happens then because you can't be outside the singularity. That's, yeah, we don't know what happens at, exactly at the point of the Big Bang. Uh, just to expand on something that, that Ron alluded to, which is uh, that measuring distances and speeds on a time on scales outside the galaxy is tricky. And the reason for that is because light has a finite speed, right? Three times 10 to the 8 meters per second, which means that, I mean, the, the whole concept of measuring distance in light years is that it's the distance that light travels in a year. So the light that you are seeing from the sun is eight minutes old. It was emitted eight minutes ago. The light that you are seeing from galaxies, the galaxies that you actually use to do these measurements of like how fast our galaxy is moving at a certain distance away from us, that light is billions of years old. So the catch is, although the universe is accelerating, and you can measure that by basically like fitting a physical model to, to these observations you make, it's counterintuitive because as you look further out, you're looking further back in time. So, so the light that you're observing is from galaxies that, based on the light that you're observing, are moving slower and also they're younger. So it's kind of, your intuition for distance and time just kind of breaks down um, with relativity once you go to certain distance scales or certain speeds. So I, 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 w I wouldn't stress about it too much is, is the, the summary. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, I mean, for as long as humans existed, basically, the Earth has been being, was being bombarded by, what other question? Okay, I'll, I'll repeat the question. The question is, um, bef before LIGO was built, like, did we live in a, in a calm Okay. It, it depends on the, the, the sensitivity of the detectors um, because they're like every observation run, it's being the sensitivity is like you know, is going down in a way, so it's we're, we're sort of like able to detect more sensitive, like the detector is more sensitive, so we're able to, to detect more signals, uh, like maybe smaller mass systems or even you know, sources that are further away. So, in the next um, observation run, the, the, the sensitivity is going to be dropped a lot more. I mean, it's going it's to be more sensitive, yeah, so it's going to be more, it's more sensitive. So we expect to have like, you know, people are predicting, you know, tens to hundreds of detections to, to start occurring during the third observation run. Yeah, so it's, it just it's, it's really just depends on, you know, the detector sensitivity and how we're improving uh, detectors every observation run. Um, right, so, uh, yes, yeah, so if you just look at the things that LIGO can detect, it is true that um, if LIGO is not seeing it, then it's probably true that there are other events that are happening out there, but it's just sub-threshold that we don't detect them. But what you also have to remember is that if you remember the plot that was shown in the talk, which is this sensitivity curve of LIGO, where you see the kind of frequencies that LIGO is sensitive to. So LIGO is sensitive to a very limited range of frequencies, but gravitational waves actually span an, an enormously larger range of frequencies. So future missions, which are still being planned and implemented, you know, things like LISA. So LISA is a laser interferometric space antenna. Array, Array or antenna? Array. Antenna. Oh, yeah, whatever. Okay. Uh, yeah, antenna, yes. 
Um, right. So Lisa will is a, is a proposed mission which will uh, fly in the 2030s, and uh, which is sensitive to a completely different range of frequencies. And there are things out there which are so loud in gravitational waves that the day Lisa turns on, they're expected to be like you know thousand times um, more, uh, thousand times louder than the most weakest the signals that LIGO, uh, Lisa can detect. So. So when you think of gravitational waves, LIGO is seeing only a very small fraction of things out there. There are things like um, very close white dwarf binary. So white dwarfs are extremely dense stars. So the sun at the end of its life will turn into a white dwarf. And you can have two white dwarfs orbiting each other, held together by the gravitational pull, which also emit extremely strong gravitational waves, but they're completely out of the range of LIGO. You, yes. Yes, exactly, yes. So there are other instruments that, are, that will be sensitive to those kind of gravitational waves. And even right now, as you speak, we are being bombarded with all of those gravitational waves. It's just that we don't have the right instruments to detect them. And on the other side of the spectrum, there are these extremely low-frequency gravitational waves, which are emitted by um, supermassive black holes. So these are uh, orbiting supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. And those kinds of gravitational waves will, are detected, well, not directly. Those are indirect detections through things um, that are known as pulsar timing arrays. So it's, it's basically another method of detecting gravitational waves where you look at nearby rapidly rotating stars to see anomalies in, their, the, in, the, in, the, in the way they are rotating. And those tell you about how space is being warped by these extremely low frequency gravitational waves. So that's the other side of the spectrum. These are extremely low frequency gravitational waves. Ah, yes. I think I'll have to see the picture. Uh, okay, uh, can I can I see it? I, I, I wasn't in here during the talk. Uh, I got a new phone now. I think that's just the um, how how far away it's sensitive out to, like you know within like what what radius. So he's talking, he's talking about the sensitivity strain. Uh, there's a plot right here, and it shows like a LIGO S six measured, which is um, one of the scientific runs. O one measured is the observation um, run, and I think there's like pre O three measurement, which is I guess right now, and there's design sensitivity. I believe uh, I'll have to like look into it a little more. I think it's like out to what what range it's sensitive to, or something like that, uh, possibly. Yeah, that doesn't really make sense because this LIGO O1 measured and has 75 megaparsecs, because the, the 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 ones measured in O1 were it was like 410 megaparsecs, the first event. Yeah, actually, I don't I don't know too much about the noise curves to really s see what these distance measures really. Uh, the spikes, those are just um, those are like just random noises and like you know like well we actually don't really don't know what they are. Yeah, yeah, these those big spikes that pop up like that. It's just it's it's just noise in the detectors that hasn't been characterized or subtracted out. I mean, there's there's people like speculate there's like there's some like um, resonant going on in some of the the, pen, the pendulums that so the supporting the detectors that cause these little spikes in the noise. But yeah. Yeah, there's, there's people who speculate that those could be um, pulsars, um, just 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 individual pulsars. Because with a pulsar, if it's um, if it's asymmetric in a way, um, it'll be generating gravitational waves. Because the whole idea behind generating gravitational waves is you got to have a clump of mass being accelerated. So you have the two binary black holes that are just two clumps of mass, and they're just like you know, uh, like the the you know that's generating gravitational waves. In this case, you have an asymmetric pulsar. So you think of like a, a a pulsar, which is a rapidly rotating neutron star, and then you would have like maybe you know there's different ways of how it could be. There could be like a bump or something, you know, on on the like the neutron star would have like a small mountain 
or a hill, whatever you want to call it. And then that, that clump of mass is being rotated because it's spinning very rapidly. And that's, that's, that's emitting at one particular frequency. And the, the frequency at, with, at which the gravitational wave is being emitted at won't evolve very rapidly because it's the evolution of its frequency depends on how rapidly the neutron star is rotating. So it, it'll depend on it, like whether it spins down or spins up, in a, you know. So those would just, like some people, you know, they had that, you know, they like play around, and be like, oh, you know, those spikes could actually just be continuous waves from a pulsar that's out there. But uh, for the most part, these they call it continuous waves. Um, all, all 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 runs currently have not detected any continuous gravitational waves because those those since they're ringing at one particular fixed frequency, they have to do like their integration over like six months. Like they get observed data for about six months. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, um, in the presentation that was earlier, they talked about the, the presenter, Jamison, Jamison, talked about how <laughs> um, heavy elements, so heavier than iron and around the, the weight of gold, are produced in neutron star mergers. And so the question was, are there other extreme elements, like an infinite number of elements that are much heavier that are being produced in these extreme environments? Which is a great question, um, in, in part because we don't know. The answer is yes. In, in theory, if you have enough energy, you can make whatever you want. You can um, add, keep adding neutrons and protons to the elements that are already existing. This is what happens in a neutron star merger. And you can produce anything. Part of the problem with that is we don't think there are that many really, really extreme environments where you get these ridiculous amounts of neutrons and protons. So it's not really, you can't really make an infinite number. And even if you do make something much heavier than the elements that we know about, it would be so unstable that we probably wouldn't be able to detect it because it'll decay very, very quickly, like in less than a nanosecond maybe. And so that we're already reaching those limits with a lot of the elements, the heaviest elements on the known periodic table. So these are the elements that we make here on Earth in labs, and they already decay faster than is useful for anyone. Does that answer your question, more or less? All right, thank you. Right, so the question was, in a normal non-rotating black hole, we expect the singularity to be, singularity to be a point. In a rotating black hole, um, we expect the singularity to be more like a ring. So what is in the center of that ring? And to answer that, I will turn it over to my friend Ron. Yeah, so there still is um, a singularity, like a, like a true singularity, as, as we call it, inside the black hole. But that, that I believe that ring singularity, I, I gotta review some of my textbooks on this. I believe that ring singularity is just a, a coordinate singularity. Um, it, it depends on what type of coordinate system you use. Um, so like we, we have those that, that, that pop up. It's really just like, you know, what type of math we're using to describe that environment, you know? And there's some singularities that you can get that you can just change to a different coordinate system. So for example, you have like a coordinate system that's like, the world we live in, you know, you have X, Y, and Z, the three dimensions that we're in, you can, you can sort of like go to another coordinate system where you can use what we call like a spherical coordinates, where you can describe, you know, how a sphere looks by just like the radius and some angular parameters rather than using X, Y, and Z. So that's like an example from going one, from one coordinate to another coordinate. So in, with, with a black hole, like inside the black hole, there are coordinates that, there are singularities that occur that are just coordinate effects. Um, but there are there are true singularities that do exist in there. Yeah. 
I know a lot less about this than Ron, but one one other thing that I remember is, I mean, th- these this, so so I think what you're referring to is like, uh, so that that idea of a rotating black hole has a ring singularity. This is one of those cases where a went went we, different coordinate systems, which means basically just like different ways of describing which where you where you are in space. Like you could say I'm five feet forward, one foot up, and two feet to the side, or you can say I'm looking 30 degrees up, I'm looking 60 degrees to the side, and six feet away. Six feet away. Um, that affects it, uh, like what these things look like. It's also the case that we don't actually really know what's happening inside a black hole. Like we, I mean, there, there's an event horizon. We can sort of, we're, there actually, there's actually a really cool radio telescope project that's working to actually like observe the boundaries of a black hole's event horizon right now. But the whole idea of a singularity is that physics actually breaks down there, so I, I think we don't, we can't say for certain what it's what it's like. At least not with our current ideas of how black holes work. Um. So yeah. So. Most of these singularities that you're, that you're talking about also exist inside this horizon. They, there are some situations where they can exist outside the horizon, but usually that, that's what we call like naked singularities, that they're exposed to the universe and they can be observed in a way. So for the most part, people don't believe those type of singularities to exist. Like they've got to be covered by some horizon that doesn't allow their information to be like exposed to us to observe. So the question was, uh, what do people mean when they say a photon doesn't age? I'd be curious to hear the, the context in which it's said, but my first guess is um, the, well, I mean, we were talking a little bit about relativity before, right? Which is the core idea of relativity is that your, the actual physics that you experience is different depending on how fast you're moving with respect to your surroundings. It's a, not a great way to phrase that, but basi- basically, the closer you get to the fa- the closer you get to the speed of light, the weirder things get. Uh, so, like if I was running at half the speed of light towards you, you would appear to be like kind of pancaked and moving more slow. Like it would be like running in slow motion. Also, I'd be dead because of radiation, but it's fine. Um, but the the point is, if a photon, if if the faster you are, if the closer you are to the speed of light, the slower time progresses. Then, if you are moving at the speed of light, time does not progress. So a photon is moving by definition at the speed of light. So it if if you were riding a photon, then uh time you you wouldn't you wouldn't see kind of all of everything in front of you and also all of time would kind of be colla- would be sort of collapse. This is again what I mean when I said before that intuition just sort of breaks down at when the, the faster you're moving or the the bigger things get. Oh yeah, um, just so you guys know, in about five minutes, five, totality is starting in about five minutes. We're happy to keep answering questions, but uh, feel free to abandon us if you want to yeah. If you want to see that. Totality will also be going for a while, so if you want to... <laughs> we want to see it too. Yeah, but we also want to see it. <laughs> but we want to see it too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so are there any other questions while we're out here? Yes. So the question was, are there any planets? So when, when planets form around a star in general, they form in a plane around the, the spinning of the star. Does that make sense? But the question is, are there any planets that, or stars that we know of where that is not the case? And there are some in our own solar system. So for instance, Neptune has a really tilted orbit relative to everything. Mm-hmm. And Pluto also has a tilted orbit relative to everything else. And we think this is mostly because of impacts. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess. I guess I answered you that question. Crap. (laughs) Uh, And we think this is most a combination of impacts and also what's called chaotic dynamics. So even in, like, a a pretty simple, even if you only consider gravity, you can still get weird cases where the interaction of multiple objects can lead to things getting ejected, can lead to things getting tilted, 
can lead to things getting really weird orbit shapes. So that happens in our own solar system. Yeah. And I mean, another way to, to answer that question is, I mean, that's a, that was a great answer about off-axis stuff. There are also plenty of eccentric, eccentric orbits. So Nep Neptune is tilted. It also has a relatively eccentric orbit. Pluto, dwarf planet, has a pretty eccentric orbit. Um, and one of the things that people who study planets outside the solar system right now want to learn is how, um, like, what is the distribution of eccentricities that uh, an orbit have. Sorry, I should have said uh, eccentricity here means basically deviation from a circular orbit. So like as opposed to the Earth, which has almost a completely circular orbit around the sun, you could have a situation where the planet kind of goes far out and then comes back in really close to the star and goes far out and comes back in. Um, and yeah, so this kind of depend. This basically could tell you about different formation scenarios for how uh, solar systems form. Do you mean hot Jupiters? So the, 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 the question was, have we observed planets that are closer to their host star than they should be? I guess there are a couple of different ways to answer that, but most of them, there, there are a bunch of ways where the answer is yes. So one of them is, um, there, there's, there's this whole class of planets uh, that astronomers have found that we label hot Jupiters, which means A, they're, they're massive, they're as massive as Jep Jupiter or more massive. Um, and they're hot because they're really close to the the star uh, the, around which they've been detected. There is a an important thing to note is there is a huge depending on the detection method you're using. There's a huge observational bias towards seeing these things as opposed to less massive or planets or planets that are further from the host star, because for example, um, the Kepler telescope, uh, uh, which you know detects planets by seeing basically observing a patch of sky, measuring the brightness of all the stars in that patch a bunch of times, and then seeing if there are dips. And a dip would mean that a planet passes in front of the host star, because it blocks, it's like an eclipse, right? It blocks a part of the, it blocks a part of the light. Um, you're really biased towards short, towards planets that are close to their host star, and you're really biased towards big planets. Because the closer you are to the host star, the more likely it is that you, the closer the planet is to the host star, the more likely it is that it's going to pass between the star and our line of sight. Because if the planet's really far out, then like, what are the odds that its orbit is aligned with ours? Uh, right? Like, it could be there, there's this whole it could be occupying a much larger swath of space. So I, they got away from your question a bit, but to answer like, ha have we found planets that are closer to a star than they should be is, yeah, we've actually detected a couple of planets, both jupiter size and actually earth size, and measured to be rock, to have rocky density, that are close enough that it seemed like their atmosphere and outer layers actually have probably been stripped away, and the only thing left is the core. So, so yeah. Are there planets that don't have a host star? Uh, the sh short answer is we we don't know, probably not. But there are brown what? Yeah, okay. Yes, we think there are. <laughs> um, we think they're pretty rare. We think that what might have happened is they could have been ejected from their host star by one of these weird dynamical events, or maybe they, there was an impact and it got so something hit it and it just left its system. And we detect these using what's called microlensing. So. Basically, the mass of something can be used to bend light. And planets are pretty small in the grand scheme of things. It's, they're tiny compared to stars and compared to galaxies, but they do still bend light a little bit. And if they're close enough and in just the right configuration, we can actually measure that bending of the light. And so we know a planet is there, even if we can't see it directly with our own eyes or with you know, other methods like the one Lee talked about. Yes, we think so. Uh, Are there any other questions? Yes. Oh man! <laughs> what makes us excited to be young astronomers? Young astronomers? I feel like. Oh. <laughs> Do we have long? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have a long career ahead of you. Um, 
I guess what one one possible answer to that is like what research do you see ahead of you that's exciting? And so I mean I I actually only started working on planet stuff relatively recently, like uh earlier earlier this uh, mid middle of twenty eighteen. And it's cool learning about the state of the field where you know, we found all these planets with Kepler, um, and there, you know, a lot of massive planets, a lot of close orbiting planets. But seeing the slate of instruments that are planning on that people are planning to build over the next even five or ten years, um, that basically, I get, like one of the exciting things for me at least is seeing the path towards finding more Earth-like planets. Like, we, it's really, really hard to do, but instruments are being designed that. Like I could conceivably in five or ten years, I could be giving someone else will be giving this talk, and they'll be talking about like the recent Earth two J seven whatever that they that they found. Cool. All right, so I study galaxies, and I think the thing that makes me really excited to be an astronomer studying galaxies is because really recently, all right, so up until very recently, we've sort of had this picture of galaxies as being stable, because we can really when we look back in at things far away, at galaxies far away. We tend to see, we just see images. We can't really see things happening on the time scale of galaxies. So we don't see in galaxies actually interacting. We just see snapshots. It's like looking at a bunch of baby pictures and piecing together the life of something based on, you know, all of their Facebook photos. But what's really exciting is now we're being able to see how galaxies form and change in real time. So with new missions like the Gaia mission, which was, has been able to measure the positions and the velocities of a billion stars in our galaxy. So over a billion stars, you can actually see how the stars have been moving in our own galaxy. And we can re we've realized that galaxies are changing systems, which is really exciting to me. And I think in the future, we'll be able to do this not just for the Milky Way, but for other galaxies too. And we'll start to get a handle on how our Milky Way actually came to be. Um, right, so as you can see, I, uh, I work on uh, how stars die. So um, a lot of stars, uh, the ones, especially the ones that are really massive, about 10 times more massive than the sun, uh, they die in explosions. And um, uh, these explosions are extremely bright. We can see them in galaxies that are billions of light years away. So that in itself, I find that quite remarkable that you can actually see individual stars exploding in galaxies that are billions of light years away. And apart from that, the reason they're interesting is because they actually tell us how everything around us was actually formed. Because uh, we know that the universe started off with a bunch of hydrogen and helium. That's pretty much all there was. But today around you, you see um, quite a large variety of stuff. You know, this wood and metals and iron and all this stuff. All this stuff was formed inside stars and inside the exploding stars primarily. And by looking at these explosions, we can actually piece out you know, what kind of explosions formed what kind of elements, and what does that, does that tell us about how the universe has come to this stage and how it's going to um, um, eventually evolve. So I think um, today, because of the, the technological developments with telescopes and computing and everything, we are really getting into an era where we are, you know, we are finding and understanding thousands of supernovae each and every year. And that in itself really opens up this you know, entire field of you know, trying to systematically understand what relates to what. Because even today, even, you know, when you actually use real physics, it's very difficult to get a star to explode when you, you know, with the physics that we understand today. So I think you know, that is quite exciting for the, you know, the era of time domain astronomy in the near future. Can you repeat the question? I I forgot. What 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 I'm excited about? Yeah. Okay. Um. So I actually do like more physics, astrophysics. So I don't really do much astronomy observations. So, but um, I think I think for me in my in my very small area of work, I I work on testing general relativity. And, uh, and previously, all, all I've mostly done is like solar system based tests and things like that. And like LIGO was just like, you know, something that could or could not have like, you know, observed binary black holes, which is like the most, the, the strongest and the most dynamical regime that we're able to test general relativity. And a lot of these things, like, you know, like I'm working in a collaboration right now where it's like, you know, it's, it's a completely new field. Um, you can like, I, I could, I could, you know, 
depending on how hard I work, I could go up to my office right now, and in six months, I could maybe come up with some weird theory or some way to observe it. And then, like, yeah, and it'll be tossed into the, you know, like, uh, analysis pipeline for LIGO. Um, like, it's just, like, how rapidly things can be turned around, depending on how much I work, of course. But it's, like, uh, yeah, so that's that's exciting, but it's also just, like, the whole future of it. Like, I, I, I could theoretically do that and, you know, get stuff that can be observed right now, or I could, you know, think more about the future. So some projects I'm working on are, like, things that are not going to happen until 2030s and things like that. But that's, you know, and I had that option to kind of go where I want, do what I want, and plus the data is there if I want to do anything with the data. So all of that's really, it's really exciting, I think, for the most part. And um, like LIGO made this detection like in September of 2015, and I started grad school in July of 2015 here. So it was like, I showed up, and I'm just like, oh, that's exciting. Yeah. One more thing. Space is so cool. It's so cool. I'm excited all the time about it. Okay. Next question. We had a question up here that was waiting. So that's a, that's a great question. The question was, um, I think, as telescopes become more sensitive and we're looking at uh, and we're and we're looking at more distant objects, or, or let's say lo looking at objects that or looking at objects while there are <laughs> gravitational waves being emitted, will gravitational waves distort the mirrors that telescopes use to reflect and concentrate light? The answer is no, because gravitational waves have di distort space on such a minute scale I, I i don't i can't i don't know the numbers in my head but th this is the reason why ligo is one of the most precise instruments on on the on the planet they what what's the statistic like you have to be ligo is precise enough to measure like a, the width of a hair like a foot i don't know like some uh, the, the distance of many countries to the precision of the width of a hair or something like that I'm looking at Ron. He's not saying yes or no. Um, <laughs> But 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 the but the, the the point is that like the um, you you just you're just not worried about those those distance scales when you're making the mirror of a telescope. Like current, one of the sort of cutting edge cutting edges of current instrumentation right now is adaptive optics, where you actually deform the mirror of your telescope to compensate for the blurriness that the atmosphere introduces into images. But. Right, so 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 the thing about that is, you know, if you're already deforming your mirror actively, you're past the point. You're not you're not gonna have to worry about uncertainty at uh, the width of a proton. Your you've your your bottom limit for uncertainty is way above that anyway. Good question though. Candidate, well, not technically candidate. Grad student, grad student. Yes, we're all grad students. Cameron left. So the question was regarding Goldilocks planets, which is a term for a planet which is in not too f like it's close enough to its host star, but not too close so that water could form on its surface. Basically, it's sort of like if you're too close, then water will evaporate because the it'll be heated away. If you're too far, it'll all be ice. So the question was if there are plans to observe local celestial bodies to 
determine whether or not certain stellar events affect those planets. So I have a follow-up question. What do you mean by local celestial bodies? Do you mean like in our solar system, or do you mean around nearby stars? Oh, so so when you say effects on a planet, you mean like whether it would impact the habitability of a planet. So I guess the short answer to that is, um, k- kind of not not really. So there there are a lot of studies being planned. Right, there, there's a lot of work being done right now to characterize atmospheres of planets. For one thing, because when uh, I think Groot, I was talking before about transiting planets, planets that pass between us and the star that they host. So when a planet transits, you can actually take a take a spectrum, like take the light and put it through a prism and use that to infer the properties of the planet's atmosphere because the star's light is passing through the, um, through the planet's atmosphere and so you can see absorption lines for all the molecules. Um, and so like there, there's a mission being planned right now called the James Webb Space Telescope that will be a telescope in space that will be able to do sort of uh, atmosphere, atmospheric characterization on a really unprecedented level. But as for... Um, as for whether af- affecting, whether it would affect the planet's habitability, it's kind of nebulous. So I was actually sitting with a recently with a professor who do, who specializes in this work, uh, Heather Knudsen, who does a lot of atmospheric uh, characterization, and she was saying that the sh- she is skeptical of any attempts to characterize like actual detection of life or detection of potential of life. Uh, through uh, atmospheres. Like, you can learn about a planet's atmosphere composition, but the error bars on some of these qualities, like abundance of nitrogen or abundance of oxygen or whatever, the error bars are are just going to be so high because the data is so messy that it won't tell you whether they're, like, biosignatures of life. It won't tell you... um, Yeah, so... That was an answer to a slightly different question, I suppose, but... um, the other answer is that uh, getting to any other exoplanets, uh, I, I, it's, it would take a long time. To sort of answer part of your question, we do actually study the ways that the host star can affect the planet. So for instance, there are these stars called M dwarfs, which we think might host quite a lot of planets. And these are very dim stars that we think have a lot of variability and may even produce a lot of you know, X-ray flares and other things. And we do think that that would negatively impact the habitability. How much, as Lee said, it's really hard to say, but it is a thing that people do think about. Yeah, it's hard to measure. It's like with the, oh, sorry. Okay. All right, do we have any other questions, maybe? Okay. I was like, does Cameron have a yeah. question? Is there still a cloud? Well, so what happened was, it was clear, it was like beautifully clear, and then within like, about 10 minutes before it was supposed to reach totality, like basically a fog formed right in front of the moon and clouded up. And right now it's like totally cloudy and you can't see anything. But we're going to keep stay here until 10. So if it clears again, um, then you'll be able to see it. But otherwise, no dice. Uh, you are all getting a taste of what it feels like to actually be a professional astronomer taking data only to find out that there is a cloud over your telescope in Hawaii. So congratulations. You're all, you're all astronomers now. That's it's true. That's true. That's also true. You can ask us, like, what's it like to be a grad student, or why is the sky blue, or... Uh, what, co- what causes the speed of light to change? So... So it, dep- so it depends on the medium through which light is traveling. So the catch is that the speed of light is constant in a vacuum, right? But... So light is an electromagnetic wave, right? It's a wave in sort of ele- the field of electromagnetism, which is, is all around us. Um, the, if, light, if that wave is passing through a medium of a certain density, um, like water or glass or air, 
Um, its speed depends on that density. Um, someone probably has a better answer than me. You can think of it as if there's a lot of stuff between you and the light, then the light will get scattered by the stuff that's in the way. It'll get like absorbed and then emitted and then reabsorbed and re-emitted, or it'll just scatter its way through the medium, and that slows it down. So even though, yes, as Lee said, in a, in a vacuum, the speed of light is constant, what's physically happening is that stuff is just getting in the way of the light, which slows it down. One cool side effect of this is something called Cherenkov radiation, where light that is traveling in a vacuum, like in space, you know, pretty good vacuum, will um, ent it'll, like, enter the Earth's atmosphere, which has non-zero density, and so it slows down. And there's actually a, a shockwave effect where, you know, t the light, you know, as it's enter once it enters the Earth's atmosphere, technically for a split moment is traveling faster than the speed of light in that medium. And so you get high, you get high energy radiation scattered from that. And you can actually measure that using uh, high energy detectors on the ground. They are heat. Um, so the question was, do photons get affected by heat? So as Lee mentioned, photons are, uh, heat is a form of photons. Heat is infrared radiation, which is just another form of light. So heat itself is made of photons. If photons get near other photons, um, they can Nominally interact, you can get scattering effects. Keisha Lay, do you remember any more basic particle physics than me? Because I don't. Keisha <laughs> um, Lay, we'll talk about. Um, right, so photons can interact with each other. There is um, this beautiful principle in physics called interference, where photons interact with each other. <laughs> so uh, photons do interact with to, uh, with each other to interference, but the idea is that so so photons have this dual behavior. They are at the same time particles as well as waves. So there's this wave-particle duality. That's a real concept in physics, where the idea is that um, photon light is both a particle and a wave, and when you when two waves they get together at the same space at the same time, they can cancel each other or reinforce each other. And that's called interference. And that's one of, the, well, one of the most beautiful principles in physics, which is actually quite widely used in astronomy um, for you know, various kinds of detection techniques. So um, yes, uh, photons can interact in those ways. But for the most part, at least you know, the kind of photons we see around us, they will never interfere with it, each other because they, uh, don't, they don't know about each other. So there's this thing called coherence, which is, which is the idea that um, Anybody? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. So okay. So um, this. So the idea is that um, uh, because you know, if you imagine these different light bulbs, they don't know about each other. So so only light that has a certain relationship to the only photons that have a certain relationship each other, with each other are able to you know interfere and produce the kind of interference things that I've been talking about. So yes. I mean, if they're from the same source, then maybe. But, like, you know, if I switch on a light bulb here and switch on a light bulb there and expect that something will happen in the middle, no, it's not going to happen, because that light bulb doesn't know about this light bulb. And yeah. you can actually, you can get interference from infrared photons if they're from the same source, though. So if, for instance, you ever go to my favorite place in the world, which is the Exploratorium in San Francisco, they have this really nice thing where you can focus infrared photons, and it's sort of a nice demonstration of, yeah, how you can have coherent interference between infrared photons. Any other questions? Which person? Maybe the person in the front, because they haven't asked the question first yet. So. <laughs> oh, moon it's, simulation. It's two different things, but that is actually... So I, I meant that to be two separate things. So the question is, what is, what is moon simulation? But I, I, I was prepared to answer questions about the moon or about simulations, or about moon simulations, perhaps. 
Um, there are, in fact, simulations that people will do to understand how the moon formed and, and how it has evolved since it formed to, to be the way we see it today. Um, primarily, the, the most popular theory for the formation of the moon right now that seems to match most of the evidence is that uh, early on, about four and a half billion years ago, the, the solar system was a slightly different place. There was a lot more stuff going on. There were a lot of rocks and such flying around. And uh, the, there was no moon yet. The Earth was just hanging out. And it got hit by a big, small, you know, a small planetesimal that was about the size of Mars. So I guess a pretty big planetesimal. Um, and the, the word, the name that we give this, even though no one saw it, because it happened four and a half billion years ago, is, a, is Theia. So Theia struck the proto-Earth. And in doing so, it flung all of this material off of the surface of the Earth, uh, which made kind of a, a ring because it was rotating, it made a ring around the Earth, and then eventually it coalesced into a single object and cooled. So then you've got the moon hanging out there, and over the last four and a half billion years, it's been struck by a number of other smaller objects which give it some of the craters and, uh, and the seas, the mare that, that you see when you look up. Those are the dark regions on it. They aren't actual seas. That's what Einstein thought, or Einstein. That's what Galileo thought when he first looked up at, at this. He called them seas, but they, they're, there's no liquid on the surface, no liquid water on the surface of, of the moon. So um, that was a long response to your question. But what was your most difficult and favorite course that you've taken as a student? Um, I, I think f for me it was probably... Um, I, I, the, the question was, oh, wait, never mind, Cameron just said it. Um, uh, I, probably the interstellar medium, uh, which is, so there's a class on the internet. That was the most difficult. Um, uh, it is, uh, the interstellar medium is what it sounds like. It's, you know, the stuff between stars. So you, you study the chemical composition of nebulae and dust, which is actually really important for learning about stars. Um, it's a hard subject. It was also taught by a professor who uh, is uh, who. Uh, These lectures are recorded, so he's not going to say <laughs> who, who who taught the class. My favorite class was galaxies because I love galaxies and I think they're great. My least favorite class was cosmology because I'm going to pass the mic now. <laughs> okay, all right. It was mostly because honestly, I don't find it that incredibly interesting. It's just not fun for me. Cosmology, yeah. The universe. But it's like, okay, it's like the boring math part of the universe. I think that there's a lot of really interesting physics that can be learned without having to do all this really boring math and use this crappy notation that whatever, okay. It's fine, it's fine. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. This is nothing against you. Um, I think, uh, so I think the least favorite was, I think I'm pretty, it was the same as Mia, which is cosmology. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's just yeah, it's just too much math for me basically. So um, uh, favorite, I probably have a couple. Um, one was high energy astrophysics because I really like high energy astrophysics, and uh, other was the instrumentation class, which I really liked because I also like instrumentation. So. Uh, Oh yeah, so my favorite class so far um, actually was not cosmology. Um, it's, um, a general, it's, um, it's general relativity, which I guess is like a more descriptive form of cosmology. Um, and I, I really enjoyed it for the most part. It was a fun class. That's the area I work in and everything. Um, and there's a continuation of that onto gravitational waves, which I really, I, I took that class twice actually, um, just because I really enjoyed the, the teaching style of it. Um, I actually did take cosmology, but I think I dropped it after three weeks. Um. <laughs> Actually, I, th I think I was taking a class with you for about three weeks. Yeah, I dropped it though. And my my hardest my hardest one I think was um, I'll probably say quantum. It's either quantum field theory or statistical physics, mostly because like I I did the quantum field theory class and I I left with it and I was just like I don't even know what I just did. I just did a lot of integrals, and I have no intuition in that field at all. 
Um, but yeah. Do we have a question? Okay, we have the question is, why is it called a blood moon and how does it get that color? Uh, so it's called a blood moon because it appears red, unsurprisingly, and it gets that color because what's happening is you've got the sun here. I'm going to draw a picture. Oh yeah, we can, we can act this out. Actually, do you want to come down and you can be in this as well? Okay. Okay, you get to be the sun. She gets to be the moon. I'm the earth. Okay, here, we'll, we'll, we'll go in front of the table. Join us. What's your name? Sarah. Sarah. Okay. Okay, come up here. So you get to be the moon. So I'm the earth, and what does the moon do? Does it orbit around the earth, or does the earth orbit around it, or do you know? In the moon's frame, yes. So that's close. So what happens generally is that the earth stays in one place and the moon goes around it. Okay? So I'm the earth and you're the moon, so you go around me. So you want... <laughs> you're redefining physics. Okay. So you're the moon. You... <laughs> You're, moon, you're the moon and I'm the earth, so you, get, you go around me. Will you do that? Okay, so you're the earth and I'm the moon. Okay, so you're the, you're the earth and I'm the moon, and I go around you. Okay? And, and Mia is the sun, okay? So what happens is, um, as I, the moon, am traveling around you, the earth... At one point, I get in the way, and I block the light from the... Oh, no, I just did a solar eclipse. <laughs> okay. Uh, so if I'm over here as the moon, the light that would normally be hitting me and lighting me up and causing you to see a, a bright moon in the sky, now I'm hiding behind you, and I don't get any light from Mia. I'm blocked. I'm in your shadow. And so... I, I turn dark, right? That's what starts to happen during the lunar eclipse. Did you see any of the lunar eclipse? Just now? No? Okay. Only a bit. But what happens is you have a cloud of gas that's surrounding you call it, called an atmosphere. And that's, that's what we're breathing right now on the Earth. And it turns out that the light is able to refract through that atmosphere and hit the moon, even when I'm in your shadow. Oh, yeah. Uh, what does refract mean? Uh, it means that the light travels through, and it gets bent as it travels through uh, the, the gas and the atmosphere, and it bends around you, and in doing so, it filters out the blue light, so only the red light is able to get to me, the moon, and then it reflects back to you, and you only see me as a blood-red moon during that period. But within about an hour, I keep moving, and then I'm not in your shadow anymore, and then I'm lit up by the sun again, and then I'm not red anymore. Does that make sense? No? Okay. Thank you for joining us, Sarah. That was a challenging question. Any any other questions? Yeah, that's okay. Good question. So the uh, the question is: Will the rings on Saturn ever become a big moon in the same way that I described our moon formed out of kind of a ring or a series of like a disky like structure around the Earth? Um, the rings on Saturn aren't just. If, uh, 
if you've seen pictures or actually seen the rings, it's not just a pure disk. There are individual ring-like structures. And in fact, there are gaps between those rings. Those gaps are usually occupied by things called shepherd moons. So essentially, you'll have a, you'll have a ring and then you'll have a moon just a little bit farther out, and it's essentially clearing that space. Uh, so the stuff that was potentially in that region either formed into the moon or fell into the ring in interior to it or exterior to it in that ring. So you have a number of different uh, shepherd moons in between the rings that are usually pretty small. Will they ever form like a single structure? I think they're dynamically pretty stable. Uh, maybe if there were a big there were a nearby planet that, that came close to it uh, and, and perturbed those, it might coalesce into larger objects. But for the most part, in its current state, it's pretty dynamically stable and should remain uh, for the indefinite future. The same is true. All of the gas giants have some ring system. They're just much, much fainter. We can't see them readily with our eyes or even with, uh, with telescopes, small telescopes and so on and so forth. But uh, Jupiter, um, Neptune, Uranus all have some rings structure around them. Uh, the why why was the, why is the Saturn ring structure stable whereas the one that formed the moon around the Earth unstable that it for, it coalesced into a into the moon? Is that your question? Yeah. I don't know the answer to that question. It, I, I think the impact wasn't enough to kick out the material to a large enough distance. Because um, the ring structure, I mean, when you see pictures of Saturn, those rings go out on the order of the radius of the planet, right? They're very, very, very large. Whereas the... Well, no, because the, moon the moon's even further out than that, too. I, I don't have a good... I'll think about it. I don't have a good explanation for that, but per perhaps. Yeah, I, I think this is, this is it, which is that the shepherd moons actually play a role in maintaining the ring structure. So the, the rocks that you see in the ring in Saturn, they're not constant all the time. They're continuously being replenished by new rocks that are being formed by you know, me, new smaller pieces of rock that are being formed by collisions among, amongst those rocks as well as with the moons that are sitting inside those rings. So in that sense, there is a continuous new supply of material that is going into those rings um, around Saturn, especially because you know, Saturn has you know, some hundred moons or something. Uh, so there is a continuous supply of rocks that is going in there because of collisions. Did you hear that? So they were talking about how the Earth does not continue to replenish its supply of mini moons. Just that impact yeah. that created all of this stuff that traveled out. Uh, and, and it was like an impulse of stuff. Whereas Saturn is continuously. Our moon is also. Is continuously yeah, our moon is also large enough that it's spherical and can actually. and has cleared most of its own orbit around the Earth. Whereas the, moon, the little moonlets around Saturn are not spherical and not as ma nearly as massive. So. Yeah, and the ring stuff is not as, there's not as much material in the rings as there is in our moon. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah? Is there a question why is there a reason why the gas giants have rings? Right. So is there a reason why the gas giants have rings but the rocky planets inner rocky planets don't? Yeah, it could be due to the mass. Let me think about that. Rita? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a... Yeah, that's a... Yeah. Yeah, Nikita in the back has made a great point. Nikita's another Astro grad student. Woo, go Caltech Astro. Yeah, so she was saying that it has to do with the sublimation radius of... So Lee was talking earlier about how there are different radii away from the star within which you could have solid ice, liquid ice, or all the ice, uh, solid ice, liquid water, <laughs> or all of the water has, is basically vapor, right? So Saturn is far enough out that most of the stuff in its rings is ice. 
and dust. That doesn't answer why, because there are Earth-like planets that are close to. I, I, I was just, I was not not, not ra raising another point, which is that there are Earth-like planets that are close to that that are much closer to their their host stars than their Earth is, and there are Earth-like planets that are further away. So. Um, Oh, so we're, yeah. yeah, so to, did, did you understand what, what Mia and, and Nikita had pointed out? Okay. Yeah, so in, as uh, to, to say, to basically give the voice to Nikita, who's in the back, answering all of these questions generously. Um, in the interior, all of the material that would go towards a ring, which is primarily ices and such, uh, those, those are vaporized and, and kicked into the outer solar system where they can cool and coalesce into the structures that would be able to form rings. Did I, did I say that correctly, roughly? OK. It passes muster with the expert in the back. Oh, more conversation. Some of it is mass, mass of the system. So l lower mass objects aren't able to hold things in their orbits as effectively, and all of the, the rocky planets in the interior are much less massive than the gas giants. We should probably, we'll, we'll curtail this because I don't want to keep people indefinitely either. Um, maybe three more questions and then we'll kind of expire. Uh, yeah, who was, the, who was the next one? In the back? So I didn't understand the question. So the question was, I think you were talking specifically in the context of the Saturn conversation we were just having. Having, yeah. So, so the 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 question was: suppose that there are rocks. There's like a rock just behind the moon, uh, or uh, how would the moon clear it out of orbit because they're moving at the same rate? I, I don't. My, I don't know off the, the top of my head. I think it has to do with gravitational in, instabilities in in the orbit. Like it's some combination of collisions with objects because I mean those rings look nice and circular now but they might not they, they weren't always that that way I mean objects were moving with different inclinations and would scatter off of each other or gravitationally influence each other so I think um, the, the answer is that it, yeah gravitational instability combined with combined with collisions So the question is, what is the importance of measuring these gravitational waves or sounds? Uh, so for the most part, um, it points out that there's a separate type of radiation that exists, because and also it's giving us uh, information um, that we could we could not detect before, uh, information about the universe, um, because all of astronomy, all the way since you know optical telescopes, uh, a thousand years ago or however long they were they were around. Um, all of it has been based, all of astronomy has been based on electromagnetic radiation uh, generated by excited electrons um, that emit photons or, you know, across like all the way from infrared to gamma rays. Uh, gravitational radiation is the gravitational analog of that, um, you know, to electromagnetic radiation. And so gravitational waves are essentially gravitational radiation. So it's allowing us a new, new more, different type of information, you know, to get, to, to get from the universe. One of the most direct examples of this, one that we've seen so far, is um, there's been a lot of talk about LIGO and black holes. Black holes, by definition, don't emit radiation. So you can't, if a black hole merger isn't happening with any gas around it or anything that would be affected and emit light, 
you can't see it happening with light, but a black black holes when they merge emit gravitational waves. And so gravitational waves are the only ways to study black holes in a vacuum. So that so that that's why I mean that's why the Nobel that's why that's why there was a Nobel Prize for this because it's just a way to study. I mean, for, it's it's proof it's proof of general relativity. It's 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 another uh, there. You know, Einstein's theory has been proven multiple times in multiple ways, but this is a particularly important one because gravitational waves have been predicted by theory since the 60s for a very long time, but um, there is no way to observe it until now. Another way is, you know, by, by hearing black hole mergers or hearing white dwarf mergers, um, you can learn about population of black holes in the galaxy, right? You can learn about sort of the distribution of masses for these things, which could tell you about this distribution of masses of the stars that, you know, preceded them. Um, so it's, it's basically a whole new avenue for learning about the universe, and it opens up doors, a lot of doors that were closed uh, using only traditional telescopes. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, and when you're hearing, you basically there are things, there are objects in space that you can hear in gravitational waves, but you can't see with light. Do you mean, so the question was, what are we learning from the unknown? So is, do you mean about gravitational waves in particular? Oh, oh you mean practical applications? So. So the question was, yeah, what are what are practical applications of what we're doing? I can can I give a quick answer? I think everyone has everyone has a different answer to this question. I'm gonna steal one from a, a a particle physicist and a documentary that was an answer I like, which is there are two answers to this question. There's the there's the the answer that's like pr practical and well actually you know it, it's it's true and will lead to avenues for science we don't know. And then there's the answer, which is the reason why everyone's actually doing it. So the first answer is, in develop, you know, you heard probably during the talk, I wasn't there, but about the technological marvel, marvel that is LIGO, right? Developing these intricate systems. In, in the course of developing the technology you need to see the most distant galaxies, to hear black holes, or for particle physics, you know, to discover the Higgs boson, you have to develop all these secondary technologies, and those have immense practical benefits. So, for example, um, I, I mentioned before that one of the current vanguards of um, work in uh, instrumentation for big telescopes is adaptive optics, where a mirror, basically, you know, atmospheres between you and stars and galaxies, atmosphere makes things really blurry. You can basically have a smart mirror that will you shoot. You basically shoot a laser into the sky, or use a star, a bright star as a reference, and do a bunch of math to tell a mirror, like pistons on the back of a mirror, how to deform it in such a way that suddenly you get a clear image. That's really great for astronomy because it gives you detailed images where before you had blobs. That's currently being used. Um, I'm, there, there are a lot of defense applications, but uh, in in like you know medical research that that kind of the the algorithms used to develop that and the technologies are used to like look into people's bloodstreams uh apparently this is like the super cool thing for like using infrared light to look into someone's skin to make a diagnosis um the development of the LHC you know the large hadron collider led to um the the most powerful magnets ever developed and those have I forget what but those are their practical applications for that so uh, oh yeah that's a good one the internet uh, the internet was developed <laughs> that's you know debate the deba pros and cons but overall it's a pretty useful thing um, um, so basically in astronomy in particular 
I was a field where the end result isn't really practical. There have been a, a ton of spin-off technologies, both actual hardware and data processing. But then there's the other. So that was the answer, which you tell the, yeah. What, what, but no, I was saying like, there, there, there's that. So there are practical applications. But then everyone actually just does it because it's really cool and we like to learn stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and another aspect of it, although none of us work explicitly on this, but being able to detect uh, near-Earth objects that potentially could impact the Earth, uh, asteroids and comets and so on and so forth, is potentially one of the most important contributions we can make. If we can save civilization from a deep impact slash Armageddon-like uh, future impact that could wipe out you know, a city or something like that. Oh, so the question is, has anyone uh, seen where two of the mergers of black holes from a gravitational wave event and two uh, and another two merger that those two merger uh, merge together? No, that hasn't occurred, and I don't think we ever anticipate being able to discover that in our time scale in the the time scale that we're detecting these, because black holes, as we understand it, black holes shouldn't be so high a density that you have a lot together um, that could potentially merge on, under those those kind of time scales. But I mean, I guess it's possible. Ron, do you guys, do you have an opinion on this? Uh, yeah, I think it's a really good question for part. Um, you could get situations when you have like, um, like you know, inside like near the center of a galaxy, there's a lot of black holes being flung around, around the, the major potential supermassive black hole that exists at you know, the center of most galaxies. Um, you could have situations where you get maybe um, a triple system if they're close enough. You have like one inner binary system and one outer binary system. So it's possible for those to sort of occur on human civilization timescales, but within our lifetime, not likely. Um, but yeah. So, oh, you're talking about them being in binaries to begin with. Okay. Um, so, for the most part, all the binaries we observed so far are stars that have existed together since their beginning. Like, you have these binary stars, they, they form together, they form as binaries, they exist as, as binaries, and eventually uh, both of them die out in some process, you know, where one, like, one, one, sort of one star dies and it causes the other one to die and so on and so forth. So towards the end, you have two stars that are essentially, you know, have like lived their entire lives together and they're still in orbit as, as, de as dead stars, which are what black holes and neutron stars are. And eventually they will, you know, merge together um, to, one fi to one final black hole. So that's the primary, um, you know, formation channel that we sort of assume right now. And there's other, there's other methods. There's... Um, uh, dynamical captures, like at the center of a galaxy and things like that. That's, an, that's another uh, way that can, you know, form these binaries. Does that answer your question? All right. Um, I have a uh, question about uh, solving the gravity problem, which is um, I don't know if you can see the screen, but you can see it. My question is, obviously that's not possible. For the most part, uh, he's, he's sort of saying like, you know, solving the, the, the gravity problem in a way, sort of getting information outside the inside of a black hole at the singularity in order to, you know, uh, do you know what the gravity problem is like altogether? Like the, okay, uh, yeah, it's, I haven't really heard much about that, but from my, from just like trying to understand the interior of black holes, like you, you're, you're dealing with an area where you will eventually see the breakdown of, of, of general relativity, um, mostly just because general relativity is a, a classical theory in a way. It treats, you know, what we call the graviton, the particle analog, um, 
that 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 you know, causes interactions, you know, um, with gravity, I guess, um, is that it, like the gravitational waves that we detect, and you know, for the most part, is the bulk motion of these gravitons. You have like ten to the eighteen or ten to the twenty gravitons that are like moving in bulk motion, so it's still its classical form. So near a black hole or inside of a black hole, it's just theoretically possible that you're going to start to see the actual breakdown of general relativity, and you'll start to get um, you know, real good data on like maybe what a quantum theory of gravity might be like. Altogether, it's just you're going to be seeing effects that are beyond general relativity, because the, the, current, the current consensus right now is general relativity is not the complete theory that it'll eventually break down. Uh, we just don't know when, um, and it's possible it could occur, like you know, the interior of black holes. So did you want to answer uh -huh. this? Um, th those are both great questions. Um, first one, for personal challenges in grad school, I think everyone will have a different answer to this question. Uh, for me, at least for the first two years, it was a, orienting yourself a bunch of, among a bunch of people who are all brilliant, and you immediately feel that nothing you do can live up to you know, the, the, the people around you who are incredibly accomplished. And you know, There's a term for this. It's called imposter syndrome. Most people get it in grad school. Um, but also um, learning how to pick what you want to work on, I think, can be, can be tricky. Um, and thankfully, in, in, grad, in most grad programs, and here also you get a chance, like you, you do a first-year project, you think about what, you know, um, see if that works. If, if not, you try something else. But um, I think that, that, that transition can be tricky. So um, if, you, if you decide to, to go down a, the, the grad school path, uh, don't expect... A lot of people in their applications, which this is kind of what you're supposed to do, you apply and you say, like, I'm going to work on galaxy formation at this, like, at, for galaxies at this particular redshift, and I'm going to solve this exact problem. And, like, that's good. You're supposed to write a detailed application. But when you get to grad school, um, it's good to keep an open mind to different challenges that you might want to work on because, you know, what is, who's available to work on what can change, um, what your interests will change, and I think it's important to just kind of be open to that, uh, to be open to the, the fluidity of that experience. Um, as for flat earthers, you can fly a plane around the earth. So I think one of the, I agree with Lee that one of the biggest challenges is the sort of transition from taking classes where there are correct answers to doing research where there. Are, no one knows what the answers are. No one knows if the project you're going to try works at all or if it's going to fail. And that can be really difficult to adjust to. I also would like to add that challenges in grad school are often compounded if you do not look like the stereotypical image of, a, of an astronomer, which is a white dude. And that can be tough to deal with. I think I didn't realize how difficult it was going to be until I got to undergrad and grad school. So that was hard. Um, I think... Reflat Earthers <laughs> at the last International Flat Earth Conference, they said that there would be prominent flat earthers from around the world coming to attend. <laughs> and I think that really just speaks for itself. For the record, Mia is one of the people that I am intimidated by and I'm convinced that so that there are a bunch of brilliant people at this table is what I'm trying to say. It's because I would win in a fight. Um, right, I think uh, Lee and me have mostly covered uh, the challenges as you know, um, I would have thought of as a grad student. Uh, but there's probably something additional that's probably specific to the field I work in, which is I work in time domain astronomy. Uh, so the idea of time domain astronomy is that we try to understand how stars die, and they die in these incredible explosions. And part of the problem is that these explosions are short-lived, well, short-lived on human time scales. You know, it, the star explodes, it's ex you can see the explosion for like a few weeks and then it fades away. But a lot of interesting science can be done if you're very alert and you f decide to follow up on explosions very early. And that's where part of the problem comes because explosions don't think of, you know, 
when is the weekend or when is it 2 a.m. in California? So, you know, at oftentimes we get texts or even phone calls, you know, oh, well, wait, there's a GRB that went off at 3 in the morning and I have to wake up to make sure that a telescope observes this event. And uh, that's part of the job as a time domain astronomer. And it, that, so G these explosions don't care about weekends, they don't care about public holidays or anything else. So that's part of the... But I would say it's an interesting experience to adjust to this. I was definitely a bit um, uh, shocked initially, but then I was like, yeah, fine, it's, I can do this. Yeah. So um, yeah, that, I guess, is what I have. Uh, yeah, so I guess, like, uh, I guess one of the things was challenges you mentioned. Uh, I would say, um, yeah, of course, there's, there's imposter syndrome. Uh, there's, um, there's isolation, in a way. Uh, I feel like, you know, a lot of times you kind of just get your head so bogged down in your work and you don't really interact with many people or you interact with only a handful of people and you start to feel very isolated in a way. Um, and like, I've, I've gone through, like, you know, maybe an entire week where I think the only words I've said were, like, you know, ordering coffee or something from some, you know, some barista out there or something. And, uh, yeah, so that, that does happen uh, as well as uh, it's really just, like, because I work in a more theoretical field, Sometimes you work on a problem for months and even even a year, and everything fall doesn't go through properly. Um, you start to realize that the idea you had is not going to work out, so you're just like, oh, okay, I guess I just wasted that that year of my life. And then, well, I guess it's not really wasted because you know you found a road that you shouldn't go down in the future. Um, there's that, and also sometimes you uh, you know you sort of like think that your idea is like really great and really awesome, and then it turns out not to be, you know, like it's either, you know, not accepted to the journal that you want, maybe it's like rejected in a way, or maybe it just doesn't pick up much momentum as you would expect it to, and you're just like, okay, well, I, I, I kind of gauged that wrong. Um, so yeah, those are, those are definitely challenges, and um, as far as like flat earthers and uh, those type of people, um, I, I kind of just, I have more better things to do with my time than to talk to them or try to debate these things. Yeah. Cameron went through grad school. I, I went through graduate school. I'm a product of graduate school. Um, challenges to graduate school, uh, staying focused on a particular topic. It's really easy to jump around to lots of different topics and projects and so on and so forth. Uh, but ultimately, the thing that you're graded on within the academic realm is the papers that you get out. And if you're just doing a little thing here that's unrelated, you know, doesn't go towards a paper, it, it isn't good for your career. So really staying focused on the things that count, which is to say single first author papers for yourself. It can be, yeah, try not to get distracted by all the other cool stuff, whether it's academic related or not academic related. I went to graduate school in New York City at Columbia. And there's a lot of non-academic distractions in New York City, so sometimes it was challenging to stay focused on that. In terms of the flat earther, how to deal with flat earthers, one thing that you can point out is um, that a lot of people, if you if you watch a if you sit and watch a sailboat go over the horizon, um, the last thing, and even the ancient Greek mariners figured this out. Uh, the last thing that you see as it goes over the horizon are the top part of the sail because it's the curvature of the Earth. As it goes farther and farther away, it's getting lower and lower on the horizon, so you only are able to see the top part, as opposed to it all just fading out uniformly if it were flat. And of course, yeah, asking them to go to the sea and stand there and watch uh, for an hour or two as a, a boat goes over the horizon may be too much, but it, it is an experiment that they could actually conduct if they really cared, and it would demonstrate the curvature of the Earth. But I find that a lot of flat earthers, I mean, skepticism is very important, not just taking for granted what someone else tells you on authority that that's the truth. Being skeptical and deciding to test something for yourself is important. And so at some level, the idea of, of flat earthers like going, bucking the trend and not, not just taking it for granted that whatever they read in a book is, is correct, I agree with that. But there are some very, very simple demonstrations that they themselves can do to demonstrate that the Earth is not flat, or even logical things like Lee pointed out, that we have airplanes that go around the Earth and don't just fly off the edge. Um, so there, there are some simple demonstrations. So I think most of it is not about the science. It's just about trying to be different and trying to disagree with you know everybody else. 
That's my interpretation of it. Uh, well, we, there are still a couple more questions. I don't know. I, I don't want to keep people here. It's pretty late, but if people have questions, you're having fun. Okay. Uh, okay. How many more questions? Raise your hand if you still have a question. I see two, three, four. Oh, a young gentleman in the back. Okay. So we'll take those four questions and then, then we'll disband. So, sir. Okay, so the question is, the consensus was that MIT throws the best parties in Cambridge, Massachusetts, by far. How does Caltech compare? I don't think the parties are very good here. Yeah, I think grad student life and undergrad life is somewhat separated, but I've heard that they build large several-story structures for parties, so that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, Blackguard House. There's a house that also drives into the desert and then explodes massive kegs of things. We don't endorse this. We don't endorse this. Also, it's possibly secret. Maybe I shouldn't say that. It's fine. <laughs> but yeah, that's undergrad life. Grad student. Yeah, in the back. What happens when you go inside a black hole? This is a great question. So I think we should talk maybe about the parts of a black hole. There's what's called the event horizon, which is the point of no return of the black hole, um, which defines what we call the ergosphere of the black hole. And then at the inside of the black hole, there's something called a singularity. We don't actually know what happens when you get to the singularity, because as, yeah, as a lot of people have mentioned, we, don't, we just don't know what happens when you get there. But on your way there, many things will happen to you, and none of them are good. So <laughs> first, the gravity is so strong. Okay. You get ripped apart by what are called tidal forces. So basically, the gravity is so strong and coming from such a dense part of space that your feet will get pulled much more heavily, much like much stronger than your head, and so you'll effectively be ripped apart like spaghetti. So we call this spaghettification. That's the actual technical term. And then you, you're, and at that point, I don't think you really care about anything else. I mean, I think <laughs> I think that's pretty much it for you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So being being ripped apart like that—that's due to tidal forces that occurs um, with smaller black holes. Like if it's only a few solar masses, for example, your body will be will be ripped apart and everything. You won't be able to go inside the black hole. But if you're if you fall into like a supermassive black hole, for example, millions or billions of times, you know, the mass of our sun, the curvature, you know, is not it's not extreme as, as much, much of an extreme curvature as smaller black holes. So when you're falling in, it's essentially a big flat plane, similar to like here on Earth. You know, you don't really experience the curvature of Earth only over long distances. And also the, how the curvature, you know, depending on how the degree of the curvature, that will also affect the type of tidal forces you experience. So when you go into a supermassive black hole, you actually can go past the horizon. Um, so you start to fall in, and what happens is that you, see, you start to get closer and closer to this massive black hole, and pretty soon like the entire area around you starts to turn black. Like, you know, it comes up like up to the horizon. But that doesn't mean that you've gone through the horizon yet. Because what happens is that um, light gets, be, gets bent um, around massive objects. This happens with black holes as well. You fall deeper and deeper, and the, black, you know, the, 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 the blackness of the, of the black hole will just start to encapsulate, like, encapsulate you all around you. And what you start to see, the, mo the, last, the last thing you see before you enter the black hole is that you start to see um, this big, like, circular thing and that's the, that's the light of all the entire universe being gravitationally lensed around, so you observe the entire observable universe right there, and that would be the last thing that you see before you fall in. Then you fall in, and we actually don't know what happens when you fall into the black hole. A lot of crazy stuff happens. But eventually, you will get to where the singularity is, and nothing can sort of escape you know, the, the forces of that, because it's, it's, like a, it's like a point, you know, so it has extreme curvature there. It's where curvature blows up. So at that, when you get there, that's when, again, you, you would get, like, you know, torn apart. So, so it's not recommended to, to go into one. Don't do it. <laughs> do gravitational waves diminish resistance? And if they do, do we have a sense of the idea for real life? Is it closer to a point of impact? 
Yeah, so yeah, they, they fall off. The amplitude of the waveform falls off as one over the distance. Oh, he, he wants to know um, how do gravitational waves diminish with distance? And also, um, if you, like, what, like was the, would you feel if you were close? Closer. Closer? Yeah, so yes, they do, they do diminish with distance. There's one over the distance um, from, from the observer to the source. Um, and if you are actually very close to a source generating black holes, we'll take an example of being um, uh, binary black holes in this case, is that you, they'll slowly go through this inspiral phase, and towards when they merge, you have this big burst of, you know, this, it's, a mer it's a merger signal, the burst of gravitational waves that get, gets emitted. If you're too close, what happens is, because it's, it's literally like space and time that's being fluctuated, and that, you know, that fluctuation can actually eventually, like if you're too close to it, it can overcome you know, the, the binding of like on, on an atomic scale, the binding energy on an atomic scale. So it'll literally rip your, your, your atoms apart of your body and you can't reconstruct it from there. So it just sort of like rips you apart on like a, an atomic scale. Um, and there's actually an interesting thing I, I think I, like we spoke with, with Kip once about uh, was that if you could hear the gravitational wave like in your, your eardrums resonate at a specific frequency and are you able to hear that before you get Blow into, blow into your atoms. That we were, we couldn't really find an answer to that, but it was it was something interesting that we were talking about. Uh, are you talking like you have like two entangled particles and then you sort of no, no, that's, that's okay okay uh, yeah actually I, I'm not really familiar on the the quantum side of, of gravity so in, in, in sort of coming with an idea of quantum gravity, there's sort of two approaches. People who work on the more classical side, you know, with GR and stuff like that, and try to, you know, see any deviations in GR. That's kind of where I work. And there's other people who work purely from, like, a, like a, the quantum aspect, quantum field aspect, and try to derive, like, fundamental, like, uh, equations that are, like, in gravity, like, you know, like... Uh, like Newtonian gravity, for example, people try to work from from like quantum field theory and stuff like that to reconstruct some of the phenomena in classical GR. So, yeah, sorry, I don't really know. I, like, yeah, I don't I don't really read much into Susskind's work or anything. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming and staying so late. Uh, again, we have these once a month. We actually have two in. Uh, in March, one is a visiting professor who's a uh, astrophysical theorist from Berkeley um, who's going to be talking. But yeah, so we have six more in the next six months. Um, I encourage you to grab a schedule out front. We'll have telescopes set up after each one in this Q and A panel. We unfortunately won't have a lunar eclipse for each one, uh, but we also have astronomy on tap once a month for the next six months. Our next one is next Monday. So, thanks everybody for coming.